And uh, I started some time back this series on how to lead a God-directed life. Some of you will remember because you were here for the first two parts. Uh, this will be part three and this will be the final installment on this topic, I believe. The Lord may change that, but right now that's what I think is going to happen. And so we've been talking about making decisions and having our key decisions directed by the Lord. When the scripture says many of us are led by the Spirit of God, of course it can be talking about God the Father, God the Lord Jesus, which includes scripture. How many know that scripture is a manifestation of Jesus? Because it is what? The Word of God. And he is what? The word of God. Amen. And then the Holy Spirit. So all of those are the spirit of God. And when they are giving direction, we are being led by the spirit of the Lord. And that's what we want for major decisions. Now, we talked about the fact that we're not talking about minor decisions that we make every day. Should I go to... Uh, uh, CVS or Rite Aid, uh, should I buy gas at uh, British Petroleum or down the street at Mobile? No, we're talking about major decisions that can affect our lives down the road, such as where we're going to live, uh, and that includes the city as well as the state or the country. It includes decisions about education. Where am I going to go to school? Am I going to go to college at all? Am I going to go to this university or that university? Those are key decisions. Am I going to marry? Am I going to stay married? Amen. I was talking to someone just a few days ago. Marriage is in crisis. And the decision has to be made about staying in the marriage. Some people are confronted with that. We have lots of key decisions that we make in life. Where am I going to be in fellowship with the church? Am I going to stay where I am? I'm going to go somewhere else. These are all major decisions and they need to be directed by the Lord. Major medical decisions should be directed by the Lord. I remember years ago I made a misstep in this area and I, I, I want to just share it because it may help somebody. Uh, Twenty years ago, roughly, I had a diagnosis of a problem with my vision and I, the doctor said all you got to do is take these drops. Well, that seemed so easy to me that I didn't consult the Lord about it the way I should have. Now, I don't know what he would have said. More than likely, it would have been the same thing. But we don't know. The point is that on something like that, we should talk to God about it. Amen. Are you listening? And get whatever direction he may give. Now, I'm going to talk today about what, what, what do you do if you don't seem to be getting any direction. But in my case, I think that because I just acted kind of presumptuously. You remember how Moses uh, in the Old Testament was told to speak to the rock to bring water. And instead of doing that, he got angry and he struck the rock. Well, the water came out anyway. Amen? But it cost him. He wasn't, that was the reason that he was not allowed to go into the promised land. Amen. So we have to be careful that we seek God about these important things and at least give him an opportunity to direct us. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, we talked also about the fact that uh, we, we have to have the Gethsemane mindset, what I call the Gethsemane mindset. And that means the same mindset that Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you'll recall, 
Jesus went before the Father asking for this cup to pass. And what that meant was that he would not have to go through with crucifixion. That there would be another way to bring salvation to man. But he, he asked three times. That's significant also. We'll talk about that. But in the end, he said this. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Amen? That's the Gethsemane mindset. So we, we, have, that, we have to approach uh, our life decisions with that mindset. What is the will of God about this? Because we can have lots of preferences and our flesh will always have some idea of what to do. Amen. And sometimes that aligns with God. No problem. But uh, sometimes it doesn't and we have to have that mindset that we're going to follow the will of the Lord. Amen. So that, that, that's key. And then we began to talk about counseling. I'm just reviewing a little bit from parts one and two to catch people up that weren't with us or that have forgotten. We talked about counseling and I talked about the value of counseling. It is biblical. I gave you some scriptures, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22, I think was one of those. I talked about different kinds of counsel that is especially important. Spousal counsel, pastoral counsel, the counsel of special expertise. And then I pointed out that counsel is biblical and it's valuable and it's important in the multitude of counsel. Uh, uh, purposes are established, but it's not a way to make decisions. And I gave you some scripture on that from the 21st chapter of Acts. We're not going to go back over that. Amen. Are y'all out there? It's awful quiet in here. I hope that means you're taking it in. You're just taking it in. You're taking it in. So we talked about counsel. And then we began to talk about the four biblical methods to get direction from God. And the first one was to inquire of God and uh, directly ask him for guidance in a particular area. And we, taught, we cited David who repeatedly did that in the Old Testament. In fact, he, he sometimes within the same space of time fighting the same enemy, he'd go to God two or three or more times. He'd inquire, he'd get an answer, he'd go and act. And then he'd inquire again, get an answer, go act. So that's number one. Gave some, a few stories about that. And then we talked about dreams and visions because dreams and visions is a biblical way that God directs people. Amen. We talked about Joseph as one example of that. I gave you some couple personal examples of things that came to me in dreams and visions that were very important. Uh, and then I gave some cautions about dreams and visions and some ways to deal with those cautions. Not going to go over that all again, but that was all in those first two parts. And then uh, we moved to the third way to get direction from God, and that is... The primary way, which is by the leading of the Holy Spirit, or the unction of the Holy Spirit. And often that is just an inward knowing or inward signal of what we ought to do. Uh, many times it's not word, a voice, or even a, a, a message in words, but it's just a knowing inside. Amen? of what we're supposed to do. And I talked about how God uses events that happen outside independently in conjunction with the unction of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit speaking to us to create the momentum forward to where he wants us to go. I gave an example of that from my own life. Um, and uh, I, I hope that as I give these personal examples that you can relate to something in your life uh, that it's not going to be the same 
uh, in most cases, but you can use the, the, the idea, the process, uh, and apply it to yourself. Amen? Amen. So, <clears throat> we talked in detail about the, uh, the leading of the Holy Spirit and how God uses, does things in steps many times. And that you, once you get through that, at the end, you see how things connected in your life. To bring about a particular end. So I've been blessed to have this direction for quite a long time. And so I do want to share more today about my own uh, experience. And believe that it will uh, be applicable to you in your life in some way. So number four way <clears throat> to get direction. And to live that God directed life is for God to initiate instruction to us on his own initiative. And uh, he will do that sometimes. You're not asking him, but he's telling you anyway. And <clears throat> he's speaking to us, uh, and it, 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 it seems to be a voice outside not in here, but outside. Um, in the uh, Old Testament, an illustration of this is Moses. In the, in the book of Exodus, you can turn to it if you like. But in the third chapter of the book of Exodus, it talks about God speaking to Moses. And remember that, you know, Moses wasn't asking about going to Egypt or anything like that. But God spoke to him on his own initiative and told him, that he wanted him to go and free his people from it, uh, the, the bondage of the Egyptians. Remember how Moses protested. But in the end, he accepted the assignment. And look at all that's happened as a result of his obeying what God was telling him to do. He wasn't looking to do it. But when he was approached by God and God initiated instruction... To do this, he received it and executed it. And my God, look at all that came from that. Abraham is another illustration from the Bible. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, you remember how God first said to Abraham, I want you to come out from your kinfolk, the country that you've been living in. And he didn't even tell him where he was going. He said, to a land that I will show you. But he, all, he did tell him some of what was going to happen if he did this. Amen. The nations were going to be blessed through him. He was going to make him a father of many nations and so on. And Abraham, now this was a big change. Come out from your family, your kinfolk. Come out from the land that you're used to and been accustomed to and familiar with. And go to a place you don't know where. But look at what came from his obedience to them. Abraham is indeed the father of all nations that are, obey God anyway. Amen. It's through the seed of Abraham we have salvation. And that seed is Jesus Christ. Amen. His obedience opened up everything spiritually. And, uh, of course, that was not the only thing that God initiated to tell him to do. He even had an even harder thing later. Amen? I think it's the 22nd chapter of Genesis with Isaac. But I wanted to share uh, just some personal experience with this. And then I want you to think about your own life and what has God said to you that you should do. When I was... Uh, Working at the University of Michigan Business School and had my life all planned out as an academic, I uh, heard God speak to me. This is May of, of uh, 1992, 30 years ago this last May. And this was uh, a situation where uh, he called me out. And he, he called me out in the middle of the night. I've shared this before, and he, 
he told me that he wanted me to start a work of ministry. And that he gave me the name. And I argued a little bit because this was not in my plan in any way, shape, or form. You see, I, I had been at the university, uh, this was 92, so uh, I came in, in, in 88, and I had, the year before, five articles published in good journals, five in one year. I got the Junior Faculty Award. Man, I was on a roll. <laughs> and I was seeing a big future. Two years later, and this is in the head a little bit, but I applied for tenure, and I did get tenure. So that was, of course, a ticket to stay for life. Um, I had my life all planned out as an academic and an academic administrator, but God called me to start this work of ministry. I argued, but he made it very plain that no, it, it, like, like he did with Moses, I'm asking you to do this. And so I did. I, I, I accepted what I believe the Lord was telling me to do. And I think some good has come from that. Not an easy road. But this is a situation where I wasn't inquiring of God. I wasn't asking God. But I had no plans about being a pastor. Being, I remember my son said to me one time, uh, Dad, you know, I know how much you enjoy being a pastor. And I said, well, uh, it's not a matter of enjoying it. It's a matter of o obedience to the, the, what God has asked me to do. Because it, 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 to have fun and enjoy is not the reason that I did it. <laughs> now, I've had lots of enjoyment along the way, but a lot, a lot of, of uh, challenge also. It's not an easy road. It's not something that people who really understand it are, are jumping up and down to do. Is that right, Pastor Noah? I was talking to a pastor friend of mine. I'm going to share with him about him in a minute. And he, he was saying to me, I think God mostly calls, the real calls are people who didn't want to do it. I think that's true. But... If we will follow what God is asking, good comes of it. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Now, another thing that I can use as an illustration is that after we had started the work, LTW, the Lord said to me, this was very early on, don't organize formally until there is another minister of the gospel with you. And he wasn't speaking of Pastor Cynthia. She wasn't a pastor at that time. But, uh, and she was never one, you know, to want to speak before people. But uh, he told me, wait for another uh, key leader to join in before you do anything formally with the ministry. So we were meeting in the uh, Bridge Clubhouse. Bridge, Detroit Bridge Club Clubhouse on the surface drive of John C. Lodge. And in came a man named Al Davis. And he actually came because his wife was coming to the meetings. We only had a small little group meeting there. And uh, she wasn't even saved, but she was coming. And she had a, we had a, 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 a dear friend of mine at the time had, was working with her, had invited her, said, you got to come to this little place and hear this, the, 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 the word taught, the scriptures taught. So she came, another little fi a funny side story about her, she, she, she quickly got saved, 
But uh, she was, uh, I'm talking about Carmen Davis now, who uh, married Al, and they, they later had five children and so on. But uh, she would hide in the bathroom when the invitation was being given. <laughs> Amen. Thinking that that way, you know, it wouldn't land so hard on her. And then when that was over, she could come out and, you know, kind of re rejoin the group. We usually had a little fellowship after and so on. But no, the God got to her anyway. But Al Davis was a powerful minister and is a powerful minister. He doesn't have the opportunities that I think God had in mind for him. But he is a very gifted man in the word of the Lord. And there are those here who benefited from knowing him. Uh, he came in, joined very quickly. He and Carmen uh, had recently been married. And uh, then for years, he was right-hand person. Uh, I don't think God had got everything out of that relationship that he wanted to. But I'm thankful for what we did do together. But we didn't move out of there until that happened. Because why? God had spoken on that. And I wanted to obey God. I wanted to follow the direction that he was giving for us. And it was of great benefit to have Al in the fold. Amen. <clears throat> Especially because I still had a full-time job, you know, for a period of time. And we uh, needed help. Needed help. And then in the meantime, we started developing, you know, other people. And uh, uh, his being there wasn't so critical. Amen. Now, uh, just using different illustrations to touch on different situations that different people have, I spoke about a key decision is where you're going to be in fellowship in the church. And... Uh, little story about that. When we were in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, as we were in uh, Charlotte for a few years and then to Winston-Salem, I had always been, after I got saved, a Baptist. And uh, Pastor Cynthia had come up in Pentecostal traditions. And so... Uh, when we got to Winston-Salem, she found this uh, little Pentecostal ministry and wanted to go there. But I had found this Baptist church, I think it was called St. Paul, that I liked. Uh, good preacher, uh, uh, very strong choir and all that. And I was used to that, you know. And so I was going to the Baptist church. And she was going to this Pentecostal church. And uh, we did that for months. And then, and, you know, occasionally she would come with me to the Baptist church, but I, I, I stuck with the Baptists. My, my family would have been Baptists going back to my great-grandparents. In our hometown, you know, Mount Zion Baptist Church, uh, my great-grandparents were central figures there and then my grandmother was a central figure there and so I was kind of strongly tied to the Baptist church but one day the Lord spoke to me and said I want you to go to this church it's called it was called St. Peter's I want you to go to St. Peter's today and so or it might have been the day before he spoke. But anyway, he spoke to me right near the time to go. And so I told Cynthia, I said, you know, I'm going to go uh, to church with you this Sunday. Well, that decision was key for a couple of reasons. The first one was it exposed me in a church setting really for the first time, to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and tongues. Uh, and, but also, it exposed me for the first time to a teaching ministry. 
because I had always sat under preachers. And that's good. And you can get, you know, inspire, inspiration from that and you can learn something from that. But I've found that the teaching ministries really do more for the spiritual growth of the people, generally speaking. You've got to get the teaching of the word. And so uh, this minister who was there at the time was in the process of transitioning the work to his son. His son's name was J.C. Hash. Well, it turned out that he was a Rama graduate. And for those of you that are familiar, uh, Rama is a Bible school, Oklahoma. It's the same place that uh, Pastor Noel's friend Philip has been affiliated with for a long time. I think he's still affiliated in some way. But if you go on YouTube uh, to Kenneth Hagin's uh, travels all around, very often you'll see Philip standing there uh, on the platform. And that is a great teaching school. And of course, Kenneth Hagin was the founder and the main teacher there for many years. So now I'm, I'm seeing this Kenneth Hagin protege at this church, little church in Winston-Salem, teaching the word of God. And man, that just grabbed me big time. And I, from that day on, I don't think I ever went back to that Baptist church. <laughs> and because of his connection with Kenneth Hagin, you see Kenneth Hagin is the, my main mentor from a di at a distance of my life. And when we started LTW, man, I was talking to Kenneth Hagin, his teachings, and many, many, many times. I had all his tapes, his books. And so I got connected to Kenneth Hagin by following the direction of the Lord to go to St. Peter's. I didn't have that in mind, but God spoke to me and told me, you go there. And the rest, as they say, is history. Amen? That ministry, it's kind of a long story, but uh, it flourished. And they eventually left that building, got a big church. And Pastor Cynthia and I went there once on a trip to North Carolina. And Kenneth Hagin was there that day. Um, I want to just share one more personal story, and then I want to share a story about a friend of mine. I hope this is helping somebody. Um, one, of, one of my key decisions of my life was about leaving the university. And as I mentioned to you, I got tenure there. I was the first, first African American to get tenure at the Michigan Business School. So that was a big deal to me. And uh, I, 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 we started the ministry formally in 94. The next year is when I got tenure. And uh, that was a great blessing of God because tenure at the University of Michigan is a very hard thing to get. But, uh, and this is a little just side note. I found this, that if we will position ourselves, posture ourselves that God's will will direct our lives. He'll allow us to do things that we just wanted to do and bless us in that even though it's not on his plan. Are you listening to me? So he, he you know, I had this experience of being an academic for 20 years not only was I an academic, but I had all kinds of success there. Unbelievable success. And uh, my writings were just circulated everywhere. And I, I couldn't tell you the different things that happened to me there. That made me feel fulfilled about that, you know. Be, I wanted to stay, but I, I was able to do a lot in the time that I was there. And so God allowed me that time, 
But then he said to me, I was driving home one day, because we were living in Ypsilanti, and uh, that's another story, the farm, because that was another dog leg off the path, you might say, uh, of the full plan of God, but it was a great uh, enjoyment to me because I all, ever since I was a kid I wanted to be live on a farm and have animals around and so God allowed that to happen in my life amen we had a farm we had eight acres of land and we were we had ducks and sheep and rabbits and pigeons and horses and <laughs> we had all that but then we had to leave that was hard Anyway, I was driving home from here one day, and I had Reinhardt Bonnke on the radio. How many of you heard of Reinhardt Bonnke? Uh, he, he was the preacher. He, he was missionary, really, evangelist. Worked in, in Africa almost exclusively. He was the preacher that when I brought that video, of this man who'd been dead for I, I forget how long, I want to say four days, uh, and his wife, this was years ago, I haven't brought that recently, but some of you will remember, his wife would not accept that he, he was in a, as I recall, a car accident, and he died. They put him in the morgue, but his wife would not accept that he had to stay dead. And so she took his body to Reinhardt Bonnke's meeting. And lo and behold, he was raised from the dead at that meeting. So I'm listening to Reinhardt Bonnke on the radio, and he talked about, at some point, the passage of Scripture where the disciples are in a boat Jesus comes walking on the water and then Peter wants to come out and walk on the water. And he's talking about this passage and he's talking about the importance of Peter actually taking the step of getting out of the boat. And I heard I was by myself in the car, but I heard a voice say, you've got to get out of the boat. And I knew immediately what that meant. He was talking about the security of the tenured position at University of Michigan. Because I had been working that over in my mind, over and over, you know, because you don't want to leave. So you, you make it like, I got to hear this real clear. <laughs> and, you know, the fact that it kept coming back to me and I kept thinking, yeah, I, I, that was God. But see, I was not ready to just, it was like, you know, we, we're going to have to take some time with this. I got to be absolute. So now he's speaking to me just like somebody was sitting in the back of the car. You have got to get out of the boat. I knew immediately what he meant. And that's when I went to the dean and told him that I had to leave. And he, he protested. He told me, listen, we can work something out. You can, you, we can change your teaching load and blah, blah, blah. And I said, Joe White was his name. I said, Joe, I got to go. That was very hard, very hard. But you see, uh, it was necessary for that to happen in order for the ministry. I think the ministry would still be here if, uh, if I had not done that, but I don't think it would be the same. 
So living a God-directed life, these are some of the things that God has initiated with me that I wasn't asking him about specifically. Um, just on his own initiation, given direction to do something. Now I want to just share before I go to uh, what to do when you don't get direction to an, an illustration from my friend Alvin Love who some of you know he's married to C.C. Winans, the gospel singer. And he and I grew up together. In fact, we live uh, one block from each other. I passed his house every day going to school. So we go back to kindergarten. But anyway, um, I was talking to him recently, in fact, just this week. And he was sharing about their story. You know, they started a church about 10 or 11 years ago in Nashville. So they've been living in Nashville for years. And so uh, he shared with me how this came about. Now I knew that his son had brought a lot of people to the house from his college to get taught from scripture. And they had people sitting around in their living room uh, once a week doing that. But what he shared with me was that he had been told, and in his case, it was the prophetic words. From, so this is, this is another method that God uses to speak to us by his own initiation is he sends somebody who's anointed of God to bring a message. So he had been given messages, prophetic messages, that he and C.C. were going to start a church which, of course, he kind of blew off initially, like no way. Uh, but uh, eventually, because, uh, see, they, they had a plan like I did, you see. Their plan was they were going to sell their house. They got a beautiful home. Pastor Cynthia and I have been there. Beautiful, beautiful home. Their plan was they were going to sell their home and move to California. And I think they had some discussions with TBN or something they were going to do and so on and so forth. Had it all planned out. So they put their house on the market. Now this is another thing that God often does to help direct us the right way. They put their house on the market. This house is so wonderful that in any times it would get offers. No offers nibble nothing for six months so this is one of the things that God will do sometimes he will cause some door to close that we're trying to go through to get somewhere that he doesn't want us to go and so they started thinking hmm God trying to tell us something? And so they had a meeting one time, one of these living room meetings, and this couple had come from Australia. And they came during the meeting, and the, the wife said to Alvin and Cece, this is your call to ministry right here. And he knew then. It was God and that he was, they were being called to start a church. So they accepted it, canceled the plans to sell the house, and uh, they're still in that same place. But here's something else to watch for because we experienced it and so did he. Once we take that step to do what God is asking us to do, he often will quickly do something to show us you're on the right track or to show us I am with you I'm going to help you do this so in Alvin's case what happened they were they started meeting in this um, well they were meeting in their home and they knew that couldn't last you know they got a big home but not big enough for the people that are coming someone came to him 
He didn't go to them. They came to him with a big church and said, we'll let you come and use our church after our services every Sunday. Worked out a, a, a real good uh, price with them, and they moved in there and started holding services. And that's where they met until last year. In our case, when we started thinking, hmm, we need to get out of this clubhouse, my wife, Pastor Cynthia, very soon after that, because what happened, we, the thing that kind of kicked it off is we came in there one day, because we would come early, of course, on Sunday, and on Saturday night, you know, they'd have bridge, and they'd be doing their thing, you know. So, uh, came in there one Saturday, and they hadn't cleaned up. One Sunday morning, they hadn't cleaned up. So, you know, there are beer bottles around, and cigarettes, and butts, and different. And we thought, hmm, this is not a good environment to be bringing in the Word of God. And so, we're thinking, okay, we got to do something here. And so, right away... Of course, you know, Al had joined, so we knew we had covered that. Pastor Cynthia and her brother were driving down Hubble, going somewhere. And they saw this little church building. Actually, it was a synagogue, but it had been converted into a church. Church of God in Christ congregation. They saw a man who they assumed was the pastor, turned out he was the pastor, standing out in front of the place. They stopped. Why? This is a man standing out in front of a church. There was no sign saying the church was for sale or anything like that. They just stopped and engaged the pastor in this conversation. And lo and behold, he started saying, you know, we've been planning to move. And he then proceeded to uh, make them an offer to buy the church. Church wasn't even on the market. They just happened to come to this particular place. Happened to see the pastor standing out in front. The pastor was willing to make a verbal commitment to sell them the church right on the spot. I mean, you know, come on. God will do things once we make that step to show that we're going to follow your will. He'll do things quickly to show you that you're on the right track and that he is with us. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I am going to share one more just quick anecdote before I talk about these last two items. Uh, when I first got saved... I uh, was a smoker, cigarettes, not other stuff, you know. <laughs> and so uh, I was sitting on, my, on, on the couch one day, and I lit, lit up a cigarette. And I heard a voice say, why are you doing that? And I knew it was about the smoking, you know. So I said uh, something. I, I think I said, uh, well, you know, it, this is something I do because it, it helps me relax. And then the voice said, do you remember the meeting? I was working at Michigan Bell at the time. Do you remember the meeting that you had recently? with your boss's boss and how not soon after the meeting started you uh, came out because they took a little break I guess and lit up a cigarette now you were very nervous at that meeting did you feel relaxed when you lit up that cigarette I said no no, not really. So then it repeated, why are you doing this? 
So I finally said, well, I guess it's just a habit. <laughs> and then he said, this is one of the few times when I had a back and forth like this with God. He said, I want you to stop. Now this was 1976 maybe. I, I wasn't... Um, Convinced, and I think a lot of people weren't, that cigarette smoking was injurious to your health. <laughs> and there was a lot of, uh, you know, ambivalence and, and about it, you know, at that time, uncertainty. People weren't sure. But uh, I was very clear what God was saying. And so I got up, took my cigarettes, threw them away that day. But later I realized all the implications, see, what he was trying to do by telling me that. Can you see it? See, God will, will uh, he'll, he'll direct us if we're willing to be directed in a lot of areas. Amen? So now um, I want to just talk about... Uh, one more scripture. This is in First uh, 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 Chronicles, the seventeenth chapter, and I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. It says uh, in First Chronicles seventeen uh, one. Now it came to pass uh, when David was dwelling in his house that David said to Nathan, the prophet, "See now." how I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under tent, cur tent curtains. Then Nathan said, notice this to David, do all that is in your heart for God is with you. <clears throat> now before I talk about this a little more I do want to point out that in this particular case uh, God then spoke up through Nathan and let David know that it was not his will that David build a tabernacle for him to get him out of the you know tent curtain business um, even though that was it was in his heart to do that but what I want us to take from it is this, that when we are not getting direction and we really sought the Lord with the Gethsemane mindset, we can then act on our own thinking of what we think should be done. And God will bless it. He'll be with us. So there are so many situations where God may not have a strong preference one way or the other about something. Or he may say, well, that's not ideal in my plan, but I, I can go along with you on that. And so he's not telling us uh, to, to go this way. He's going to let us go the way that we're thinking to go. And just like it says here, God is with you. He will still be with us and bless it. Isn't that good news? We can do things. I told you about the farm. You know, <clears throat> it was something I always wanted. And so when we're looking for a place, we're moving from Michigan back to, uh, from North Carolina back to Michigan. Uh, we come to this property. We had looked at a bunch of properties. And I just, I wanted it. I walked it. And I, I said to the Lord, I want this. I wanted it, you see. It wasn't a case of God directing or me feeling. So I, but I didn't feel any leading or direction about God for to, for particular play, uh, property. So... I just picked the property. This is how most of us get married. We get married to somebody that we want. 
and if they're uh, a suitable spouse, God, God's going to bless it. He's going to bless it. We choose, he blesses. We choose, he blesses. This happens all the time. Do you believe me? So the thing to do when you're, you feel like I've, I've really tried to give God an opportunity to show me on this and I'm not hearing anything, I'm not seeing anything, nothing, no kind of direction, then just decide something on your own thinking. And if it's wrong, you'll get what David got in this situation, which was, no, 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 you can't do that. Because that's what happened. If you keep reading, he quickly spoke up through Nathan and told David, uh-uh, that's not what I want. And that's what he'll do with us. Are you listening to me? But if he doesn't, you just keep doing what you're doing. Sometimes we overcomplicate things, you know. God, you're not answering. You're not, I'm not hearing anything. Why don't you speak up? Why don't you show me? Instead of just saying, well, maybe he's just leaving this thing up to me. I'm just going to do what I want, I'm going to do. Sometimes I actually tell the Lord, listen, this is what I'm going to do. If you've got a problem, you need to let me know. <laughs> Amen. Now, before... The last thing I want to do is uh, how, how to distinguish is this God? Because we all have that problem, don't we? Yeah. Is this God or is this my own just ramblings and thinkings? And our mind is such a, I mean, you know, a lot of things go through our mind. And... Uh, Many times we're questioning, Lord, is this you who brought this to me? So I want to give you these four or five things to look for. Number one, which you would expect, is what you're hearing has got to align with Scripture. Amen? So uh, divorce is an example. If you're, here, if you're hearing, you need to divorce this, this wife. You need to divorce this husband. Um, or if that's just welling up like a strong want to do. Sometimes people feel like that's what's supposed to happen. That's what needs to happen in this situation. But we've got to go back to Scripture and see what God has said about it. See, uh, we don't have to inquire with God about things that he's already written in the Bible. Is that right? So there are some conditions under which uh, you, marriage can be terminated and a person is not uh, under bondage is the terminology that the Bible uses uh, meaning is the person is free to remarry. One is unfaithfulness by the spouse Another is unsaved spouse who does not want to stay in the marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 speaks about that. And it talks about if the, if the unbelieving departs, don't go after them. Just let them go. And the, the, spouse, the, the believing party is not under bondage in such cases, meaning that you're, you're free. Now, that's pretty limited. And... Uh, we see, unfortunately, in the church, lots of other reasons uh, used for divorce. And people sometimes want to put it off on God that, you know, I prayed and the Lord told me it was all right and all that sort of thing. The first test is, is it aligning with Scripture? If you're hearing that uh, I want you to date this unsaved person then you need to read 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 6 very carefully. Amen? Because it speaks about that in very clear terms and lets us know that that's not a good idea. 
A lot of times people, Christians, they think, well, I'll just date, you know. No harm done. We're not talking about getting married. But see, the problem is your, people's emotions get involved from that seeing the person. Because it, to start with, they're attracted to the person. That's the reason why they're dating them. That can very quickly turn into an emotional attachment. And then it becomes very hard to obey what God has said. Better is to not let it get to that point. Are you listening to me? So if you're hearing something, you know, and Kenneth Hagin gives an example of somebody coming and saying, you know, the Lord has shown me that this man's wife is supposed, really supposed to be mine, and all that kind of crazy stuff. We know that certain things, when they're coming, we know this isn't God because it doesn't line up with the word. Amen? The second thing to look for is repetition. And... Uh, God will always repeat. Uh, now, sometimes you get repetitions on things that are not from God, but this is one of the things that you can look for with God. I remember the, the story of Samuel. Remember when Samuel was called, he was called three times. And the first two times, uh, he thought Eli was calling him. And then he was going to Eli, and Eli was saying, I'm not calling you. What are you talking about? The third time, Eli kind of caught on and said, you know, I think it's God that's calling this kid. So he told him what to do. And that started him hearing from God. And how many know that he, he heard really well because the Bible says not a word that he spoke ever fell to the ground. In other words, everything he said, he never missed it as a prophet. Never missed it. Praise God. So, repetition. When I talked to Alvin about their call, he got not one, but many repetitions of that prophetic word that he was, and CC was supposed to be pastors. And so, it will be repeated, and that helps us to know, yeah, okay, God, I'm getting it. Number three thing is that law, not always, but many times, it's something that the flesh does not do. So I already told you, I, didn't, I did not want to be a pastor. That was not my, on, my, on my agenda. In the flesh, in the natural. But that's what I was called to do. I will say this, that I'm very thankful for it for many reasons uh, of course one being you know you see what happens with people and you, it, that, make, that makes you joyful to see uh, that you had some small part in it but uh, I'm also happy because it allowed me to minister as an equipper and not an evangelistic person See, that would have been really rough on me to try to go out and convert people, you know, strangers and stuff like that. Uh, sp spreading the gospel in the, in, you know, in the coffee shop. I know people do that just regularly, just go to coffee shops and things like that and just start talking to people. Do you know the Lord or, you know, what are your spiritual beliefs? And, you know, they just work that in and next thing you know, they're preaching. That would have been very hard for me. And so God, in his mercy, has allowed me a role that kind of fits my personality. Working with people who are already half interested in what you got to say. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's a, uh, you know, I thank God for that. But uh, the flesh often doesn't want to... You know, my flesh didn't want to stop smoking. It's used to smoking, liked to smoke. Why quit? You're enjoying this. Well, many times, God's saying, he's, he's giving you direction. You need to apologize to her. You need to apologize to them. Flesh does not want to. 
how many witnesses out there. A lot of times you can tell it's God because the flesh it doesn't want to do it. Uh, you're getting a message saying you need to start exercising on a regular basis. How many think that, that Satan is the one that wants that? No, Satan wants us to just forget about those things. That, you know, keep going to Burger King, forget about the exercise. Why? Because he, he wants you in the grave just as soon as possible or laid up to where you can't do anything. It's God that would want us to have long life. Amen? And health. Can you say amen? amen. And then number four, and this is a little bit more subtle, but it's a sense of certainty in here about it. This is, this is it. This is what he wants. And when you get that sense of certainty, then you, you, you're on your way. You know, I got it. I got it. It may not be what you wanted to do, but you know, you know I, when I think of this one, I always think of uh, us leaving Detroit and coming eventually here, but Southfield and then here. Um, I knew what God had said. I just knew. I knew. I was absolutely certain that he said, come out to a place that I'm going to, and I'm going to show you a, a, another place. So when I went to the leaders, I just told them. I didn't say, I believe this is what God wants. I didn't say, I think we need to do this. I said, this is what I heard from the Lord. I was very sure about it. So when you get that, you kind of know that you have heard and gotten it right. And then the final thing is, uh, and this is especially for new Christians, um, confirm with your mentors or a mentor what you think God is telling you. A lot of times, you know, when people are thinking about what is my call to ministry, they're a little uncertain and they think about different things and uh, it's good to go to your pastor or uh, the elders in your life that you trust and talk it over with them. Ask them to pray with you about it. And, and I always tell people, you know, if, you, if they ask me to pray, I'm going to pray. If I hear something, I'll tell you. I'm not going to make something up. If I feel like I already know, I'll just tell them. But if, they, if, if not, I'll, I'll, I'll pray. If I get something, I'll, I'll share it with you. But uh, sometimes we don't. Amen? But that's very valuable to us all, but especially for newer Christians uh, to confirm, uh, what is this God? You know, do you, do you believe this is God? And that's one of the reasons that pastors are in our lives. Amen? That's one of the reasons that uh, Jesus gave us uh, leaders at that level. Amen? Uh, so we need to take advantage of that. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Well, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to share. To lead a God-directed life It's a good life. It's a good life, and there's so many things that will open up, praise God, if we will follow that direction, and not just for us, but for other people. Amen? And some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it, and, and so, I'm just so thankful that uh, I've experienced this in my own life. And, uh, and seen the wonderful things that have come about. Praise God. And so will all of us. And, you know, God wants us to know how to navigate with the direction from heaven.
Confidence, taking back the land is promised. We will not forget.